Well, it is a delight to be with you. Let me dissuade you. Uh, Dr. Sosie was asking you this morning, will this be a political message? Uh, it is high and holy political season. If you haven't been tracking with that, Labor Day marks the beginning of, of the uh, high political season leading up to midterm elections, but this will not be a political message this morning. So I don't know if you're celebrating that fact or lamenting it. <laughs> there it is. Um, but actually, uh, what I think the Lord has laid on my heart this morning to share with you is something that is generated that we see a lot of in the political world, that as Dr. Worth mentioned. One of my passions and interests within the field of political science is how the role of religion and religious believers as citizens in this country can play a role. And there is perhaps no other community in, in our American polity that is willing to lay down what we think is true and important and beautiful than evangelical Christians. We're one of the few people that can collectivize and say, well, what we think is most important and what we order our lives by, we're willing to set that aside and not contend in the political world for perhaps public policy positions and things like that. So it's from that genesis that I'd like to speak to you this morning from the scriptures. I'd like to speak to you this morning about what I think it is going to take and look like to contend for the faith and the Christian faith, particularly in the days ahead. And I'll say more about this later, but sadly the days of comfortable Christianity, if there ever was such a thing, are fast, becoming, are fast coming to an end. And the cost of effectively contending for the Christian faith will go up. In Jude chapter three, if I can find my clicker, here we go. In Jude chapter three, the author here, Jude, exhorts his readers to contend earnestly for the faith. And it is within this context that he, can, he, he exhorts his, his readers to contend for the faith because they are threatened from within by false teachers who had crept into their midst unnoticed. And it's important for our purposes this morning to note the manner in which Jude exhorts his these believers to contend for the faith. They are to do so in an earnest manner. And the word Jude chose here signified an intense contending, as one would have as a combatant in some kind of contest. So Jude's purpose in this short book was to exhort these believers to recognize the danger of false teaching and to admonish them not only to stand firm in their faith, but also to fight in a positive sense for the truth of that faith. So this morning on our brief time together, I, I'd like to offer you, for your thoughtful consideration, what might be some of the current dangers that we face in our day, both from within the body and from without, that will challenge us. Like Jude, I want to warn you about these things and beyond that to exhort you, my brothers and sisters, to effectively contend for the faith in our day. So in short, I wanna share with you a concern that I have and charge you to at least give some serious consideration to something you may not have noticed before that's going on all around us. So I'd like to speak in two facets to contending for the faith this morning. One very shortly in terms of a positive aspect of contending for our faith, and then mostly in the latter half of our time today speak to what it would look like to contend for the faith in terms of something that might rob us of our ability and our energy to do that. I talk to my students a lot here about seeing Biola University as an incredible time of equipping. And when I had a choice to choose whatever chapel I wanted to speak at, I wanted to get in early to give you something as a way of a barometer for you to think about, particularly you first year students. We talk a lot about here at Biola University, our education, but I want you to see a project that's going on here that I wanna invite you to, uh, perhaps for you upperclassmen, renew afresh in your mind, but again, for your first year students, I want you to see that this is a unique time in your life, to do some things that as you graduate and you move into whatever phase the Lord has you move into next, you'll be impressed with the fact that this is a very, very unique time in your life to do some things that you will not have time for to this degree. This is a time to wrestle with a lot of things. It's time to become increasingly equipped for something, to contend for the faith. 
The university, this university, is perhaps unique in standing for the commitment of the integrative approach to the educational process that we offer. And this is very encouraging to see that the, that the leadership of this university stands strong. I'm very encouraged as I've met my freshmen this year who are starting our political science program and, and we've been talking to them, they've been writing short essays on what brought them to BioUniversity. And almost to a person, what brought them to BioUniversity was that they were impressed by the fact that this university is not ashamed to integrate the academic project and the Christian faith. Many universities that hold themselves out to be Christian have abandoned this project long ago, and I'm so grateful to be here. Let me just ask you a question to reflect on for a second. Do you realize what a small percentage of people you find yourselves within? Particularly a small percentage of, of believers who have the privilege of being able to do this. You are the future leadership of the church. You are, could be the future leadership of, of things within society. And I'm thinking particularly about graduate students. You have an opportunity to be educated and trained in such a unique way. And so the question before us is, what will you do with it? What will you do with it? To whom much has been given, much is required. So being able to be a part of this project is easy for us who count ourselves privileged to be employed by Biola University and to be here on a day-to-day -day basis. And so as you're here, you'll get a chance to wrestle with many of the foundational ideas that compete for our intellectual allegiance. This is one of the reasons I continue to teach that philosophy course that so many of you have probably had with me. And for those of you that haven't had it with me, your senior year will come up and you will have to take that philosophy class. But this class is particularly suited, one of the reasons I continue to teach it, because it is particularly suited to exposing ourselves to, in many cases, the ideas that press upon Christianity, painting it as simply false. And this is okay. This is the, this is the place to wrestle with these ideas, because that is the project of the university. But the project of the Christian university is more robust. The project of the Christian university is not simply to expose you to a smorgasbord of ideas. It is to impress upon you, train you, help you contend for this fact about the centrality and truth of Christianity vis-a-vis -vis these competing ideas. You ought to see as a project here in short, your time at this university, to become increasingly convinced and impressed with the explanatory value of Christianity to explain things in life. That this isn't something that we've checked into, that we've checked our minds at the door and we become Biolans or believers in Christ. But that you ought to be impressed over your four years as you wrestle with these ideas and sometimes competing ideas that Christianity stands up very nicely. As, as someone who I have read a lot of, Richard John Newhouse says that the goal of the Christian university is to ground and direct our intellectual curiosity about the intersection of faith and reason. And the goal of the Christian university is not simply knowledge, but wisdom. And wisdom, wisdom comes via the cultivation of your mind. Now here's the main thing I'd like to talk to you about, and this is really what's been on my heart all summer and what I've, what I've sort of taken time as I think the Lord has given me the snippets of things that he'd wanted me to share with you this morning. This is what could potentially rob us of the ability to actively contend for the faith. And I want you to consider that there's something afoot, and, and, and if nothing else this morning, I want to just put something on your radar to this effect that there is something afoot that would rob you of the ability to, to effectively contend for the faith in our day. As I said before, part of what it means to be a university is to encounter the world of ideas. And those of us who have been doing it any length of time, and even first year students here, will probably not be surprised that many of the prevalent ideas of our day come to quite cr different conclusions than Christian theism. In fact, many of these ideas are outright hostile to Christian belief. So here's what I'd like you to think about and consider. I want you to be aware that under the pressure of these ideas, which have the prestige 
of the modern academy, of the modern university, that under the pressure of these ideas, that too many of us are too willing to kowtow to these ideas and by default, and by default, reject the implications of Orthodox Christianity. In other words, if this becomes even remotely true in our lives, then you will not be effective in contending for the faith in today's marketplace because this, because this move does not represent an amplification of your Christian view, it represents an abandonment of it. And here's the deal. There will be voices both within Christendom and with them from without Christendom, from, from the outside. And you must know that, you must know that this, that this is the case before you seek to be part of contending for the faith. In short, you will be called to shrink back from the clear implications of Christianity in today's culture. You will be called to shrink back from the clear implications of Christianity in today's culture. Let me give you an example. Dr. Borsman mentioned I spent almost 20 years in campus ministry. I had a very interesting encounter with a philosophy professor before I had the privilege of studying analytic philosophy and ethics here at this university and this seminary. And this seminary, uh, this philosophy professor said to me, some of you have heard me relate the story in my classes, but for those of you who haven't, it really communicates where I think too many of us are at on this issue of contending for the faith. I was part of a campus ministry movement, perhaps the largest one in the world. The average student movement of campus ministries in the average secular university is probably 75 to 100 students. This one had about 1,500. And as I was talking with this philosophy professor, he became acquainted with what I did on that, on that particular campus, and he said to me, you could take all 1,500 of your students, your Christian students that are involved in this campus ministry, and you could take them off campus tomorrow. And if there was a meter that measured the ideas on that campus, if there was an idea meter, if you removed all 1,500 of your students tomorrow, that meter would be unchanged. In other words, there was nothing in the lives and, and, and workings of those 1,500 students, according to this professor, that affected the idea structure of that campus. And I asked him why. And he said, because your students come into our classes on a daily basis and they hear things that are antithetical or challenging to the Christian worldview, and they do one of two things. They simply adopt Christianity to be consistent excuse me, to be consistent or consonant with those false, false ideas or, or challenging ideas. Or, more likely, what they do is they set up a bifurcation or a schizophrenia in their life where their Christian life becomes something that they put over here in the corner and their intellectual life, informed by these other ideas, is sort of the dominant aspect of their life. Neither one of these is conducive to people who would be effective in contending for the faith. But why is this such a tem tempting thing to do? Because the intellectual and cultural direction of our day is filled with pressures to cause us to want to soften the edges of the Christian claims. To soften these edges of the Christian faith in order to make them more palatable or agreeable to what is becoming day by day an increasingly more secular culture. And the church is getting this and the church in general is being influenced by this. My family attended a church in South Orange County one day, and, and I, we were new to this church, and I was particularly interested to, to uh, get to know what defined that church. And as, as good fortune would have it, this church was having a video in which they uh, edited and put together a series of responses from people who attended that church, and the, and the people were asked on that video what one word would you describe that would define this church? Heard a lot of different things. This is a blast. This place is a great place to come. Fun, laughter, uh, a variety of different descriptions of that. Not one person described that church as a place of truth. Not one person described in any kind of description that that church was a place where they came to have reality described to them and amplified. Is that how you think of Biola University? It ought to be. It ought to be. If we're not a community grounded upon and acting upon the bedrock that Christianity is true, 
then we are not gonna be a position, in a position to contend for the faith in the days ahead where what we hold will become seen as increasingly outdated or hateful, more likely. So I alluded to this fact before, but I take no pleasure in saying that the days I think of comfortable Christianity, if there ever were such a thing, are fast coming to an end. You simply cannot miss the fact that the cultural trajectory in which, the, in which we live, that, that the teachings of Orthodox Christianity will be increasingly at odds with a cultural consensus. We talk a lot in my political science classes about the, the trajectory of, of the social issues that, that, that are salient political issues. And if you pay attention to any of those kinds of things, you see that in many cases, we're on the short end of the stick in terms of where the cultural consensus is going on those things. And the temptation for us is to cave and to soften our edges on that. Every day, more and more pressure, I believe, will be brought to bear on believers in this country to conform. And we cannot lose, or I should say it this way, we can lose some sense of that in this very comfortable environment here at Biola. But let me invite you into the world, into the world of what many of your brothers and sisters confront who attend very different kinds of universities. Just this week, InterVarsity within the entire UC, University of California system, all 27 universities, has been de-recognized. InterVarsity Christian Fellowship is no longer welcome as a, as a recognized student group within the University of California system. Why? Because they require their leadership to be Christians. Now there's fancy language out there. There's fancy language that says that, that leaders within, within that particular organization are required to hold creedal beliefs of a certain sort that apparently the University of California system finds unpalatable. And I think you know what issues that the, that the leadership of InterVarsity would hold to that would cause them to be derecognized. The cost of contending for the faith from InterVarsity and other student groups just went up. InterVarsity, gratefully, is not packing up their bags and calling it quits. They're, they're going to fight this legally, but they're gonna have to find different ways to, to reach out to those campuses. So the cost of contending for the faith in the University of California campuses just went up. As Dr. Borsma has, has mentioned, free exercise rights in this country are under increasing attack in our day. We, we, I think I forgot to advance my slide. You put these things together, you gotta put them up, right? <laughs> Increasingly today, for a variety of different reasons, religious free exercise rights will be coming under increasing attack in this country, and you can count on the fact that as you mature in, in, into, a, uh, into even more mature adults, and as you start having families, you will start to feel the implications of this. This university is feeling the imposition. We have, a, we have a lawsuit against the Health and Human Services. You might want to acquaint yourself with the, with the reasons behind that. But essentially, the reason behind that is that the government purports itself to be in a position to define what is suitably religious and what is not suitably religious. And in the current state of the law right now, or at least under legal challenge, Biola University is not viewed as suitably religious to meet a religious exception to a law of general application. It is a dangerous position when the government defines what is suitably religious or not. So here's the application. What am I trying to say to you? I'm trying to say to you I'm having trouble with my slides. <laughs> well, I have no idea what happened there, so that's a beautiful picture anyway. So what am I trying to say to you? And the answer is that there's a growing pressure that will be brought to bear on all of us to see certain aspects of Christianity as optional or as just one perspective on things. And why would we feel the pressure to do that? Because conformity is much easier under that pressure than pushing back. But we're not called to conform to this world. If there was a nice slide behind us, you would see Romans 12 that I put up. We are called 
not to conform to this world, but to be transformed. That is increasingly going to be the call of our day. Conforming is much easier to do than pushing back. At the heart of what I think the Lord would have me say to you this morning is to be warned that there is a growing pressure that will be brought to bear on all of us to remove the sharp edges of Christianity. And make no mistake about it, the claims of Jesus are stark. His hearers of the day certainly understood his claims to be quite stark. But we should not and we cannot be looking to adjust the truth claims of Christianity to make them more palatable to a culture increasingly hostile to anyone who takes this religious stuff too seriously. We are not called to proclaim Christianity light. The temptation will be for us to shrink back from the clear claims that Christianity makes upon us and do what many do, obfuscate. Or they'll say that when push comes to shove, we'll just say fancy intellectual sounding things like, uh, well, this, the, the, these issues are just too murky. Or things are just more complicated than that. So when push comes to shove and we're called to stand upon the sharp edges of Christianity, the temptation under this cultural pressure will be to go soft. Well, sometimes things are complicated. But what I'm trying to say to you is that if we offer this as an excuse to avoid the obvious implications of Christ's teaching, then we may be falling into a pitfall where we fear a label from men more than we love the truth of God. And I want you to notice how many times this strategy is employed when the implications of a theological view cause cultural, intellectual uncomfortableness for believers. Notice how many times people go soft when times get tough. We can't do that. My friends, we're called to be Jesus' disciples. And this entails being all in. This requires accepting the implications of his teaching, contending for the faith, even in an environment where there's pressure to cave. And the most extreme examples where I saw student after student, and you can look at the statistics for those of you who may be studying to be youth pastors, you can see the statistics of youth group kids who, who give it up, who cave. And there's a term for what many, uh, there's a term that describes what happens in the case of many students' lives, and I've been involved in way too many of them, and it's called the narrow escape syndrome. That students come to the university, and they discover a broader world than their parents uh, uh, expose them to. They discover ideas that paint Christianity as false, and they, they come to see Christianity as a kind of narrow-minded view that's just too narrow to accept by an enlightened person. And the narrow escape syndrome that these Christian students who leave the faith adopt is roughly the idea that they say, I have narrowly escaped the confines of this conservative Christianity that I've been raised in. They cave. They cave. I've been, I've been interacting with a student, my last semester philosophy students um, were, were, were day to day on this issue. I've been, I was, I'm interacting with a young man who went to the University of Kansas, studied architecture for a couple semesters and announced to his parents that all that he had been raised in was baloney. And his mother, uh, through tears, called me and said, you know our son, would you talk to him and see if you could bring this young man back to think? Well, I've had several phone conversations with this young man, and he is about as hardened, scornful, he thinks that he's in touch with a world now that presents what you and I believe is absolutely ridiculous. He's a tough nut to crack and he's been an interesting guy to deal with. But you know what? He doesn't know what in the world he's talking about. And it doesn't take much to, to, to see through that because this guy is filled with a bunch of slogans that he's adopted. And when pressed to defend those slogans, he simply can't do it. It's apparent that we're going to need real leaders even more as we go forward. Leaders who have a mind and intellectual backbone to be willing to make the hard arguments and not, not be bent by popular whims of thought. 
We cannot adopt beliefs or pursue activities because the culture will hassle us less. I saw this happen in the campus ministry. It became increasingly difficult over our 20 years to share things on a university campus in that kind of environment that entailed that people confront the doctrines of sin and the need for redemption. And a lot of students wanted to cave. Instead of taking that message to the college campus, they were finding other things to occupy their time and do things that made them feel good, at least they were trying to reach out to the university, but with softened edges. And they were, they were pursuing evangelistic things that were devoid of confronting people with their sin and their need for redemption. It could be in our day, and perhaps this might be the most controversial thing I say, I don't mean to be this controversial. If there's anyone who can speak to the issue of justice or social justice in our society, certainly this body of people is able to do it. But we cannot adopt activities, even as laudable as, as notions of justice, because we're ashamed or driven back from addressing what the real needs of people are in life and the most fundamental eternal needs, the need for Christ and the need for redemption of their sins. So even ministries as laudable as some of the things that we currently find ourselves involved in cannot be embraced because we shrink back from the hard edges of a gospel message that saved people's lives eternally. There may be very good reasons to hold given positions or pursue activities, but holding to a view of pursuing activities because we are implicitly or explicitly ashamed of the Christian faith or because we simply don't want to live with the full implications of it is not a good reason. And sometimes being principled in this way is scary. But as we contend for the faith that Jude exhorts us to do, we can't pretend to go forward in the absence of fear. But we must not shrink back in light of that fear. Contending for the faith in our day is tough, likely to get tougher, but we must not forget that the Lord goes before us and is ever with us. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.